You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Johanna from almost just outside of Vienna and you are listening to your favorite international podcast. If you're thinking now, well, wait a minute, something is missing, then you're absolutely right. Annie can't be here with us this week. Don't worry, nothing happened. It's just a little bit tricky for us at the moment to schedule our day to make it work so that we can record together because we have a construction going on over here in the house and almost all of the hours where Annie has time to record, I have banging and knocking and drilling in the whole house. And when Annie could record... I'm sleeping (laughs) and this week was just no way for us to make it work. Don't worry, she'll be back next week and everything is fine. She'll be back with us in no time. But don't worry because I have a great case for you today. It's an unsolved case from Austria from the 1920s. Some say that this case is not really unsolved. They think that it is pretty obvious who is the culprit, but unfortunately justice was not served and wait until the end and then you decide what you think. Also, trigger warning, I will be mentioning suicide slightly in the end of this episode. So it all takes place in 1928 in Vienna. This was the time between World War I and World War II and I'd say 1928 might have been the last carefree you know, more or less carefree year for quite a while, because in fall of 1929, the great crash on Wall Street happened. So the stock market crashed after a decade of excessive economical growth. What followed was the so-called Great Depression, and it was not only the US of A that suffered from the crash, but Europe as well, because, you know, economy had become globally intertwined. In Europe, just like in the USA, unemployment rates skyrocketed, which led to a rise in poverty, And as it is so often the case, demagogues could easily convince that the strengthening of nationalism was the way to go. And we all know where this was going to lead. But enough with this quick historical excursion. As always, this was just for you to place this case on the historical timeline. So 1928 was still rather carefree. All throughout the 20s, people enjoyed somewhat of a very tolerant and wealthy lifestyle for the first time in ever, probably. And by wealthy, I don't mean that everybody was suddenly rich or living in luxury. I mean that now things became more widespread, things that used to be unimaginable only a decade earlier, like telephones, all kinds of electronic devices, cars. I think you know what I mean. And there is a reason the 1920s are often referred to as the Roaring Twenties or the Jazz Age, or here we call them the Wilden Zwanzigers or the Wild Twenties. Dance clubs became popular, skirts and hair were worn shorter than ever before. I think 1928 was also the year women got the right to vote in the UK. Correct me if I'm wrong. But back to Austria. 1.9 million people lived in Vienna in the late 1920s. That's uh, almost exactly the same population that we have nowadays. And when I was looking at photos from that time, I came across a photo from one of the public pools. It was taken in summer of 1928, so pretty much the time this case I want to tell you about took place. And frankly, I was quite amazed because it showed men and women in bathing suits dancing in the grass around the pool. But the amazing thing to me was that many of the men were wearing thongs. Did you know that thongs for men were a thing to wear in public in 1928? Because I had no idea. And I assume it's because bodybuilding became more popular in the 1920s. It's just such a great photo and I share it in the Facebook group. I think I mentioned it before that our last apartment in Vienna was close to a wooded area where we would walk the dogs every day. And this small wooded area used to belong to a way bigger area, a wildlife preserve called Lenzer Tiergarten, which has a size of 24.5 square kilometers or 6.5 acres. And it used to be a fenced-in hunting ground for the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I back in the 1560s, but it has been open to the public since 1919. And when you walk through the Lanza Tiergarten, you might encounter boars, deer, foxes, badgers, so much wildlife. And of course, you can't bring your dogs there in the Lanza Tiergarten, but it's a lovely place. Most of the time, you won't encounter another person on the trails that lead through the park. Uh, also, 
Don't forget, you're not allowed to leave the trails. I love to go there in late fall. It's just... Uh, it's beautiful. A quick description of the Tiergarten, which also translates to zoo or literally animal garden. But what we mean by it is a zoo from www.metropole.at. Quote, Leinzer Tiergarten, where the wild things are. As hard as it is to find solitude in a city of almost two million, it's far from impossible. At Leinzer Tiergarten, nature preserve in the 13th and 23rd districts, you can have a whole forest to yourself, bearing the occasional wild boar. Since opening to the public in 1919, the 2,450 hectares of Wienerwald has been a getaway for locals, as most tourists don't bother undertaking the long journey to Vienna's distant west. Make sure to check opening hours beforehand, as some gates aren't open all year round and the park closes at night to avoid disturbing the animals, between 5pm and 9pm, depending on the season. For the same reason, there are no dogs or bikes allowed. However, there is a trail following the 22 km long wall that encircles the reserve. There are six gates leading into Lenzer Tiergarten, with the most accessible being the Nikolaitor, a 10-minute walk from the U-Bahn S-Bahn station Hütteldorf. Upon entering, you'll see one of Vienna's oldest buildings, the Nikolaikapelle, a charming chapel built in the late 12th century that was probably part of a castle. You can still see remnants of a wall and moat. If you're expecting an ornate interior, prepare to be disappointed. The building was looted in 1945 and never got refurnished. Follow the many signposts and you'll reach the scenic overlook Wiener Blick after a 20-minute walk. As the name suggests, it offers the park's second best view over Vienna. There is a spacious meadow if you need a little break. Once you've recovered, head on to the cultural highlight of the forest, the Hermes Villa, a gift from Emperor Franz Josef to his globetrotting wife Elisabeth. He hoped the secluded mansion, far away from the bustle and intrigue of court life, would entice her back to Vienna. Resembling something from a fairy tale, C.C. referred to it as Castle of Dreams. Now converted into a museum, visitors can have a peek into the private life of the imperial couple. They also have a restaurant on the premises that sells picnic baskets filled with regional goodies if you prefer lunch al fresco. Just don't step off those pathways. Close to our exit gate, there is a deer enclosure. As the animals are used to visitors, they will come to the fence to say hello if they are in the right mood. We have now reached the Lanzer Tour where the 55A bus line can take you back to civilization. Vienna is a city of palaces and coffee houses, but its wild side is still fit for an emperor, as the Lanzer Tiergarten aptly demonstrates. End quote. And again, I can only highly recommend that you go and visit the Lanzer Tiergarten if you ever have the pleasure to travel to Vienna, but don't forget, stay on the trails. And why did I tell you all about the nature park? Well, because it's the place where this horrible crime took place there in the park. It was on 17th of July 1928, around 4 p.m. Two workers were busy working close to the Hubertuswarte, so that's on the Kaltbründelberg, the tallest hill in the 13th district of Vienna with 508 meters or 1,666 feet. I hope you measure your, your heights of mountains and hills in feet. I'm not sure. I think you do. All of a sudden... The two men hear several gunshots, but at first they don't think anything of it because they think the sound comes from a nearby shooting range. And then, approximately 30 to 45 minutes after the shots being fired, a thunderstorm brewed up and several lightning strikes could be seen in the area. After the storm passed, the workers and visitors saw smoke emerging from close to the aforementioned Hermes Villa. And of course the workers make their way to the villa immediately because they fear that the mansion had been hit by one of the lightning strikes and was now on fire. At 5 p.m. they arrive at the location of the smoke, which was not the Hermes Villa, but in an area that is called Saulacken. So Sau is the German word for a female pig, and this area was, or still is, rather swampy, and that's why the boars love to go there and roll around in the mud. This is also a rather isolated area, pretty much off the path. And as I said, it was not the villa that was on fire, but... A body lying on the ground, a blaze. So the body is still burning, according to some of the sources. The workers immediately try to extinguish the fire. The body was severely burned, but thanks to them extinguishing the fire, it was not completely burned. 
And someone, probably somebody passing by, was sent to the police and firefighters. I think there was a police station at the Hermes Villa already. And I was just thinking, aren't we all happy that we have mobile phones with us now and we don't have to run to the nearest station to get help? I actually once had a really similar nightmare where I needed to get to the police station to get help for something and I just couldn't find the right street. And that was not a fun dream, I can tell you that much. Anyway, the police and the firefighters arrive on scene around 6 p.m. The police start to close the crime scene and they try to ask every possible witness, which was a little bit challenging at the time because um, there was an international choir festival in Vienna, the 10th annual Sängerbundfest, which brought 50,000 guests to Vienna, according to the sources, which is amazing. Uh, so that meant that some of the people leisurely strolling through the park that they were from other countries. Some of the witnesses were from England, for example, and I can imagine that it was a bit difficult for the Austrian police to conduct interviews in a foreign language. Some witnesses said that they had seen a dark-haired man who must have come from the direction of the victim quickly leaving the park. And what the police finds at the scene of the crime are a can with gasoline and some eurotropin. And I had to Google that when I saw the word because I had no idea what it was. But when I saw a photo, I immediately recognized it. And I think you will too. So the, it is these little white squares that you can use for camping, for example. It's also called solid fuel, I think. And as far as I know, you have to be really careful with these things. The fumes are poisonous. The examination of the body determined the cause of death. So the victim, a woman was, you might have already guessed it, she was shot. The body showed several gunshot wounds to the head and there were no shells found anywhere near the scene of the crime. So someone shot this woman whose age was thought to be around 30 and then set her on fire with the gasoline and solid fuel they had brought. We can assume that this was planned way ahead and not a spontaneous crime because who carries a can of gasoline and eurotropin around while taking a nice afternoon walk in the park? The victim had no papers on her, no handbag was found with her or in the surrounding area anywhere. She wore almost no jewelry except for a bracelet or bangle, I think, and there was no engraving at all. The clothes she was wearing and the shoes were of very good quality. The shoes were made in Italy. The clothes were custom made. Yeah, they couldn't really track that, where that came from. But it was really high quality clothing, which meant that she was probably a member of the middle to upper class. The problem was there was just no way of identifying the woman. Of course, the police started to look into the missing person reports, but no luck at all. I guess there must have been a lot of people missing. We talked about this a lot already in other cases from that time or, or earlier than that. Maybe you remember I said that many people came to the cities to find employment and often they left again because, for example, they missed their family or because they got fired or any other of the many reasons they could have, but they often would leave without telling anyone. Friends, for example, they made in the city or co-workers or landlords. So not all of those missing person cases had a sinister root, but some of course had. The police looked through the reports but found nothing. Newspapers printed sketches of the shoes and the bangle and hoped that someone would come forward who would recognize any of those items. Nothing. And then rumors started to spread. For example, that the victim was the daughter of a noble family who had run off with her lover, that she was in town for the singing festival, or they speculated many things. But again, nothing came of it. And also now and then witnesses would be able to name a suspect and then these men would be brought in. But again, nothing. The identity of this poor young woman remained a mystery. And now I have a question for you guys. Who of you used to watch MacGyver back in the day? Because I did. And honestly, there is only one episode that I remember vividly because it made such an, such a huge impression on my young mind. And it's the one where he finds a skull and he uses the erasers on pencils to recreate the face of the person that the skull belonged to. Now watch me completely misremembering it and someone will send me a message telling me that this never happened in MacGyver and that I must have dreamed it. I don't know, that's how I remember it and that's what I had to think about when I read what they did next. They recreated the face of the victim and here's how they did it. 
So in 1924, a Viennese doctor by the name of Dr. Alphonse Poller invented a technique to carefully create a mold from bodies. Before him and his new technique, coroners or plastic surgeon, for example, used the material to form the mold that could destroy the skin of the body part or the hair or they couldn't form all the fine wrinkles, therefore would give not a 100% correct recreation. But Poller started to use a material named Negocol, which is an irreversible hydrocolloid impression material. That's a mouthful. It's basically what your dentist uses when he makes an imprint of your teeth. You know, that pink, nowadays I think it's pink stuff, very soft. The revolutionary thing about it was that it was formable at body temperature. So you didn't need to use it when heated up. You let it cool down before you started to work with it. Thus, there was no resulting tissue damage. And it could be removed easily. You know, They said it's just like taking off a glove. There's a quick excerpt from an article by Dr. Samuel Eglauer from Cincinnati, and it's titled The Use of Negocol and Hominid in the Making of Moulage as an Aid to Plastic Surgery. For many years, there has been a need for some material with which impressions of various parts of the body could be taken with ease certainty and comfort to both the patient and the physician. After many experiments, the late Dr. Poller of Vienna succeeded in producing such a plastic substance to which he gave the name of Negocol. Negocol is an elastic hydrocolloid which forms a thick paste upon being heated and which, on cooling and returning to the gel state, has a soft rubber-like consistency. Uses. With Negocol, it is comparatively easy to obtain three-dimensional moulages, which are valuable for study and planning prior to plastic surgeries, and which afford a permanent record of the deformities. Negocol is also useful for the permanent reproduction of gross anatomical or pathological specimens. It may be employed in medical cases to record wounds or injuries or for the identification of criminals. Reproductions of rare artistic or archaeological objects can also be made from distribution to collectors or museums. To take an impression of any part of the body, the negocol is heated and steered in a double boiler and it liquefies. When it is allowed to cool to approximately body temperature, it is then applied directly with a brush, spatula or syringe in successive layers until a thickness of about one inch is attained." End quote. And that's what they did. They formed a so-called moulage from the woman's face and her jaw and her teeth. Well, actually, let me correct this. They made two different models of her face. One is the model of the face, how it was when the victim was found. So the expression of the face is very disordered, very painful. You can see the gunshot wounds. And the second model is how they think the woman would have looked when she was alive. Because of course they wanted people to be able to identify her. If you ever come to Vienna, you can still take a look at these two models because they are on exhibit at the Kriminalmuseum. I talked about this museum several times already, definitely when I was talking about Theresia Kandel, but I think there were other cases where I mentioned it. And when I tell you the next part, you will think of another case, one that Annie covered a while back, the Lady of the Dunes. Because this victim from the Lanzer Tiergarten did not only have expensive shoes and clothes, she also had expensive dental work done. I think she had several gold crowns or gold teeth. And so the police tried to find the woman's identity by contacting the Viennese dentists, hoping they would recognize the dental impression. But again, nothing. For roughly a year. Because finally, on 12th of July 1929, a dentist can identify the set of teeth. He is absolutely certain that they belong to a patient of his. He's certain that this is his work. And the patient's name is Katharina Fellner, born Katharina Schäfter. Now, if you ask yourself how it took them a year to find the dentist, you are asking the wrong question. Because not the police found the dentist. Apparently, the dentist found the teeth. Or at least, according to some sources. So apparently, one day, the dentist, uh, Dr. Reisberg, visited the Kriminalmuseum. Wait a minute, Johanna. The Kriminalmuseum already existed back in 1929. Yes, it did, because it was founded in 1899. Back then it was called Police Museum. It looks like the moulages of the unknown victim were brought to the museum and people could go look at it, which it's smart because you want as many people as possible to be able to see it. You know, you're still hoping that one day somebody would recognize her, right? 
Now many think that the dentist just one day casually strolled into the museum and looked at all the macabre stuff they put on display there and all of a sudden he sees the moulage and immediately recognizes her teeth. I mean, that's certainly possible. But what I do think happened and what does make sense in my opinion and is kind of backed by the sources and newspaper articles of the time is that the dentist somehow got to talk with a police officer maybe an acquaintance or maybe a patient. And so the police officer tells him about this unsolved case and hey, could you go down to the museum and have a look, please? Whatever way it happened, I'm not 100% certain, but thank God it did happen and now they have the woman's identity, Katharina Fellner. Now what do we know about Katharina Fellner or Katharina Schefter? She was born as the daughter of a working class family, so she grew up in rather poor conditions. As soon as she was old enough, she started to work. Sometimes she worked as a waitress, other times as a so-called Sitzkassierin. I think that's... I don't know if it's just typical for Viennese coffeehouses or European coffeehouses in general. So what it is, is... I don't know, for a long time, women were not allowed in coffeehouses. I think that was until 1860 or something around then. And Sitzkassierin was the only job they could have in a coffee house outside of the kitchen because artists would go to coffee houses, uh, politicians, actors. It was not a place that was considered to be suitable for women, except for the Sitzkassierin. Now, it literally translates to seating cashier and it was basically a woman sitting behind the counter of the coffee house and in front of her was a huge catch register. You know, the ones with all the buttons and the crank handle on one side. And that's where you would pay your bill. I just found this to be such an interesting piece of coffeehouse trivia. So Katharina had this kind of job and also apparently she later worked as a showgirl or a singer. Again, the sources say, state different things here. And then somehow she meets a very wealthy man, a bank manager, and Katharina becomes his mistress. And he takes care of her financially even after they separated because he would give her a huge amount of money. I don't know how much or I would have converted it to horse money, trust me. But it seems that it was enough for her to lead a secure lifestyle. So Katharina then travels around. One of her trips takes her to Budapest where she meets a man named Andreas Fellner. He was a tailor and they met when Katharina went to his shop in Budapest to get a dress altered. Now, I don't know, did they fall in love? Did only she fall in love? Was he a nice man? I don't know. The only thing I can tell you is that they get married. Unfortunately, this marriage was not built to last and everything turns sour rather quickly and Katharina leaves Budapest and travels around again. They are not divorced yet. They are just separated. Mostly she would visit Italy. So probably that's why she was wearing Italian shoes at the time. And she started to gamble. She loved to go to the casino, but it looks as if... You know the saying in German, we have Pech im Spiel, Glück in der Liebe. I don't even know if this exists in English, like lucky at gambling or luck at gambling, unlucky in love would be the rough translation. So that didn't apply to Katharina because she didn't have much luck in her marriage nor at gambling. She lost a lot. It even appears as if she ran out of money. We know that... Well, of course, we know that because of the newspaper articles, but they knew that because of a maid from a place Katharina had stayed shortly before she had returned to Vienna, a maid in a hotel. So what happened was that Katharina wanted to give the maid a tip, but she was out of cash. She told the maid that she would return to Vienna because she had a lot of valuables there, some fur coats, jewelry, maybe an heirloom carpet, who knows. But because she felt so bad about not being able to give out a tip, She did give the maid an item of clothing. I think it was a blouse or a skirt or something. That fact kind of made me like her because as a former waitress, I would have so appreciated the gesture. It would also be something I would do if I would own actually nice stuff because I don't think anybody wants my H&M sweats, let's be honest. Katharina Fellner traveled to Vienna and shortly after, she's found dead in the Lanzer Tiergarten. I think actually it was the day she arrived in Vienna that she got shot. And of course, the first suspect is most often who? That's right, the spouse. And the police thinks the same. They are separated, probably didn't end their relationship on good terms. And now I see two possible motives. One, 
He would have to pay a huge amount of money to Katharina after the divorce, kind of alimony. Or two, he wanted to have Katharina's wealth, which he would have gotten as a widower. Makes sense, right? But he didn't do it. He had an airtight alibi on the day Katharina was murdered. Now, again, this case is so confusing sometimes, and I'm gonna tell you later why, but... Again, different sources say different things. So one says that on the day Katharina was murdered, he was on a road trip to Venice and he had even gotten into an accident and all of this was well documented. So there's just no way that he was in Vienna at the same time. Unless he used a doppelganger to drive to Venice and get in an accident on purpose. Was, was that the plot of a movie or am I making this up right now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anymore. And then, as I said, another source says that uh, Andreas Fellner was on vacation in Bad Ischl, which is in Upper Austria, but also back then with the transportation and the roads and, and the cars, it would have been impossible to be in Vienna on time. Again, could be correct, but looking through old newspaper articles, they mostly talk about him being in Italy, so I'm going to assume that that one is the correct one. <laughs> in the end, it doesn't really matter, because the husband didn't do it. But the police learns of another suspect, a friend or former friend or former lover of Katharina, a 39-year-old man named Gustav Bauer. The police wants to talk to the guy and they go to his apartment and they find his apartment is empty, abandoned. Gustav Bauer has fled Vienna. Don't worry, he shows up again on 18th of August 1930 so more than two years after Katharina's murder, Bauer reappears. He is found in Berlin and he is brought back to Vienna for interrogation. Because of course, he's now the number one suspect. The police learns that he is a salesman for jewelry. He met Katharina Fellner in Italy and they started an affair that ended in 1925, at least according to Gustav Bauer. And he also states that they stayed friends afterwards and he now has an affair with at least one woman while being engaged to at least one other woman. And the police and media deems Gustav Bauer's lifestyle to be quote-unquote questionable. He of course denies any involvement with the crime. He comes up with an alibi that just on that day, when Katharina was found, he was actually visiting his brother in the hospital. Only problem... The brother remembers that he got a visit from Gustav Bauer in the hospital. He just doesn't remember what day it was. So the police can more or less prove that the visit took place a couple of days earlier. There's another red flag, right? Fleeing the country was one. Lying about his whereabouts was another one. But wait, there is more. There always is more. What he did next while he was in custody was that he did write notes to some of his friends asking them to come up with an alibi for him. I think he was smart enough apparently to at least try and use some code words, but it looks as if he wasn't smart enough to actually make it undecipherable. As you all can guess, that plan didn't work. The police found the notes, the police could decipher the notes. So that was not good, for him at least. The trial then starts on 7th of November 1930. Very interesting witnesses are being called. So there's for example a friend that testifies that he was asked by Gustav Bauer for a browning gun. So Gustav Bauer did own a gun and the gunshot wounds on Katharina were caused by a gun with the same caliber. Then there's a taxi driver who testifies that on the 17th of July 1928, so the day when Katharina was murdered, he took Gustav Bauer and a woman to the Leinzer Tiergarten. A little while later, he took only Bauer back to the city, so the women didn't come with him. A maid that worked for Bauer testified that she knows for sure that her employer owned a gasoline canister that looks just like the one that was found near Katharina's body. And she didn't see the, the canister again after that day. She doesn't know where it, it, it just disappeared. Then the owner of a fur shop testifies that Gustav Bauer has sold him several fur coats that match the description of Katharina's fur coats. But Gustav Bauer defends himself by claiming that Katharina had handed him the fur coats so that he could sell them for her. He also claims that the woman in the taxi with him was the woman he had an affair with. And the taxi driver um, was then brought to take a look at this woman. And then he was completely unsure and thinks, yeah, it's possible that it was her. And I don't know. 
I think all in all, Gustav Bauer's defense attorney did an amazing job of making the whole trial extremely confusing and, and really defending his client. That's what I meant when I said the sources and the, and the newspaper articles are so all over the place sometimes because I think that the whole case, the whole trial, it was just confusing. It was a mess. The defense attorney also calls new witnesses all the time and they come up with new evidences and yeah, it's a mess. So the judge decides to adjourn the trial for over five months. Five months, can you imagine? And it only continues on 11th of March 1931. And it's just the same cat and mouse game this time. They even present a man who really looks like Gustav Bauer and that man states, yeah, I was at the park as well on that day. And yeah, a mess. Finally, the prosecution and the defense make their closing statements. This alone takes almost eight hours. I mean, can you even imagine eight hours of closing statements? As a member of the jury, you must have been absolutely exhausted by then. And now the jury retires to come to a verdict. And I don't know exactly. I tried to find out how how the law was in 1928. But what I did find in one newspaper article, and I wish I could just read it to you, but it's in German. But what this says that to come to a to a guilty verdict, you needed a vast majority of the jury members voting for guilty. So there were 12 jury members, and I assumed that you would need more than eight members of the jury voting guilty, right? Guess what? The jury returned with five people thinking he was innocent. And now, do the math, that leaves seven voting guilty. That's not the vast majority, apparently. And that was it. Gustav Bauer was acquitted, and he walked out of that courtroom a free man. Even though most people, the media, and even the police, because they made notes in his file, secret notes apparently, that were found later, and even the police, they were absolutely sure that he was the murderer of Katharina Fellner. Which means justice probably not served. And that's why in the beginning I said that it is considered an unsolved case, even though most think they know exactly who did it. Including me, I think. I'm pretty sold on him being the murderer. I don't know, what do you think? But that's not all. There is one more thing. A while after the trial, Gustav Bauer was found dead. He hanged himself in his apartment. He had died by suicide. In the apartment, they also found a letter where Gustav Bauer once more claimed that he was innocent, but that he was still considered guilty by most people in Vienna and that this had ruined him. Not only had it ruined his business, but it had also ruined him socially and therefore he didn't want to go on like this. Now again, I have one source that says that he committed suicide on 17th of July 1932. So exactly four years after the murder of Katharina Fellner. I don't know. I have a feeling that this date is not correct and is just used for shock value. You know, like in our things that make you go, hmm, episode. Other sources say it was actually roughly eight years after the murder. And then I also read eight years after the trial. So this is just as confusing as the trial. I mean, doesn't really make a difference, but I just want to put it out there. And that's it. That's the sad case of Katharina Fellner. My something good this week is my mom's husband. So we are renovating the house at the moment, well, just the upper floor. And he knows construction sites so well. He worked in construction companies for most of his life and he's like an all-rounder. And he helps me so much with his knowledge and, and tries to calm it down whenever there's something, you know, how it is when you buy an older house. I think all of you who did it, at least regretted it once. I was at this point last Saturday, so when we found out that there were wood worms or wood bugs, I don't know how you call them, in the beams. Thank God, not in, in the important beams, just in the decorative ones. But uh, we have to stop it, of course, before it spreads. And two walls were what we thought are real walls. They are mess. They are fake walls. And yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. And he helps me so much and I'm beyond grateful. Uh, we didn't always have the, the best and easiest relationship. And that's, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that he's here for us. So that's my something good. 
All right, guys, uh, and that's it. If you enjoyed this episode and or others of our episode, please do us a huge favor and go to, I don't know, I know it's iTunes, uh, some other podcast apps start to do it now. Just check if it's possible that you leave us a rating and or review. It really helps us out a lot. If you want to know all the ways how to get in contact with us, go to www.freshhellpodcast.com. There you find links to our merch store, to our PO box, to our uh, email, what else, Facebook group, Instagram, all the ways you can contact us. Join our Facebook group. It's a lovely group. We have great discussions, uh, a lot of house porn, pet photos. It's great. It's the only reason why I still have Facebook, to be honest. And please tell your pets I said hi. I'm probably, I'm, I'm really sure Annie also says hi. So tell them we said hi. Tell them we love them. Tell them we miss them. It's so great always to see your pets. They are the cutest, funniest, most amazing pets. And I love the variety of pets that you all have. Hug them, cuddle them, treat them kindly. Give them a lot of treats. A lot, a lot of treats when they are good. Also when they're not. I mean, we just call it they're having a character, right? And also be kind to your fellow human beings. At least once give them the benefit of the doubt. And until next week, if you yourself are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss.